turns out this is 2x plus 1, I think. No, 2x minus 1. And x minus 3. And this down here is x plus 3 and x minus 3. Okay? So when you factor this out, this is what you get, which tells you right away that there is a removable discontinuity. Yeah. That's the same thing. Removable discontinuity is a whole at x equals 3. It also tells you that there's going to be an infinite discontinuity, right? An infinite discontinuity at x is equal to negative 3. And if there's an infinite discontinuity there, there's going to be a vertical asymptote at x is equal to negative 3. This is not x is not equal to negative 3. That's the restriction on the domain, but the vertical asymptote itself is the line x is equal to negative 3. Now, is there going to be a horizontal asymptote? I don't know. You could try to figure it out. Let's see. As x approaches infinity, what's going to happen here? Well, these are going to become insignificant. These are going to cancel out. And you are going to be left with a 2. Yeah, there's going to be a horizontal asymptote at y equals 2. Are there any slant asymptotes? No. So no slant asymptotes. Now, what can we do here? As x approaches 3, if we just plug 3 in here, it becomes undefined. But here, we were able to cancel these out. We got this. Although x cannot be equal to 3, x is going to approach 3. And there will be a single removable discontinuity there at 2 times 3 minus 1 over 3 plus 3, which is equal to 6 minus 1 over 6, which is equal to 5 over 6. And that's the answer. If you didn't know how to do this and all you did was look at your graph, you might have seen 0 0.83 or 0 0.84 and thought, yeah, that's close enough. But it's not. You should be able to do this. What is the pattern? Well, some of you found cubics. And that's just way harder than it needed to be. If you multiply 1 by 2, you get 2. If you multiply 0 0.8, 0 0.3 by 8, you get 0.24. If you multiply 2 by 2, you get 4. If you multiply 2.4 by 8, you get 19.2. If you multiply 3 by 2 and get 6, you can multiply 8 by 8.1 and get 64.8. This is multiply, multiply. And that makes it a power function. So this is multiply, multiply. Makes it a power function. And what does a power function look like? Power function is f of x is equal to a x to the b. 
Um, in this particular case, we could say that 0 0.3 is equal to A times 1 to the B. Hey, guess what? That gives us A right away, doesn't it? 3 over 10. How nice. So now we can plug it back in, and let's go for 2 here, and say, um, what was that? 2.4? 2.4 is equal to 3 over 10 times x to the b power. Let's multiply both sides by 10 over 3. What do you say? Wouldn't that give us 8? And don't we already know what x is? x is 2, right? So what's b? 3. So let's just double check and see if that works here. Um, f of 3 would be equal to 3 over 10 times 3 to the third power. 27? 2.7? 8.1? Just for fun, let's try 4. f of 4 is equal to 3 over 10 times 4 to the 3 power, 3 over 10 times 64, which is uh, 3 times 6.4, which is 2, 19.2. So the specific equation for this function is f of x is equal to 3 over 10 times x to the third. This one. Hmm. This is clearly multiply by 2. This is clearly add 1. This is clearly logarithmic. This is multiply add. This is logarithmic. Not logistic, but logarithmic. which means it's really the inverse of an exponential thing. So that x is equal to a, b to the f of x. So if 2 is equal to a, b to the 2, and 4 is equal to a, b to the third. If we divide these two, b winds up being equal to 2. Everybody see that? We put this over this, the a's will cancel out, and most of the b's will cancel out. Just leave you one b. <coughs> 4 over 2 is 2. Let's see what happens if we say um, 4 is equal to um, a times 2 to the third. Well, that would give us 4 is equal to 8a. a would be equal to 1 half. Okay. So that means x is equal to 1 half times 2 to the f of x. Now, of course, this is really x is equal to 2 to the negative 1 times 2 to the f of x, which means x is really equal to 2 to the f of x minus oh, f of x minus 1. And if we take log 2 of both sides, log base 2 of x, is equal to f of x minus 1, and that makes f of x equal to log base 2 of x plus 1. Now, as it turns out, you could have done this with log x. You could have done this with the natural log of x. 
This would still have a plus one, I think. This would have some kind of a coefficient here. And if you did, it was right. I gave you credit for it. Okay, there are two varsity croquet teams. You got an A team and a B team. The A team has an 80% probability of winning. The B team has a 60% probability of winning. There were a few people who asked me, are they going to play each other? Which was a perfectly good question. And the answer was no. They're, they're, they're different. Now, the probability that both teams win, well, for both teams to win, you got to have an 80% chance there and a 60% chance there, and that turns out to be a 48% chance over here. Okay. Either the A team or the B team, and it should actually say wins. This, this is singular because of the or um unless of course you're british in which case the team win so right so what's important now is either the a team wins in which case that's the point eight and the b team loses which would be point four or the a team loses and the b team wins or they both win. That would be 32 plus 12 plus 48, which would equal 0.92, right? Yeah. After I was all finished grading all of the papers and somebody came in and asked me about this question, I suddenly realized you might have interpreted this to mean only one team wins and both teams don't win. And it doesn't say that because it says or, and this is why I hate using or instead of intersection and union. But then later on in this problem, when it's talking about the prizes, it talks about if exactly one team wins. So what would be the probability if what this meant was either team A wins or team B wins and we're talking exclusively so that they don't both win? Well, then the probability would just be these two added together, right? If anybody had 0.44 or 44% and I marked it wrong, uh, come to me after class and I'll be glad to change it because I think that's a a reasonable interpretation of the problem. Probability that B wins and A does not. Well, B wins 60% of the time. A loses 20% of the time. That would be 12%. Now, department's mathematical expe expectation. And mathematical expectation in this case if both squash teams described above win, and how likely is that to happen? Well, exactly that likely. And if that happens, they'll win $200. If only one of the teams wins, well, that's either uh, 0 0.4 times 0 0.8 or it could be 0 0.2 and 0 0.6 and if that happens they'll get a $30 plaque and if neither team wins what's the probability of that that's 0 0.2 times 0 0.4, they'll have to pay $100. So that's a negative amount. Okay. So that's, that's what we're talking about here. Now we got to do the arithmetic. 0 0.48 times 200 is 96. 0 0.32, 0 0.12, that's 0 0.44 times 30 is... 13.2, yes? 
okay? And then this one will be a subtraction. It's point, oh, this is eight. Um, so this is actually 96 plus 5.2, which turns out to be 101.20. So the mathematical likelihood the mathematical expectation here, if this were to happen an infinite number of times every week when the teams went out to play, on average, they'd make $101.20 a week. If there are 20 workers and we want five of them, there are 20 for the first one, 19 for the second, 18 for the third, 17, 16, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and if we don't care what order they come in, it's 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. What does that mean? Oh, it means this goes here, this goes here, this goes here, and then we multiply those numbers together. But that's not what the problem asked for. What the problem asked for was using factorials to write the number of different ways they could select the group. And basically what that is, it's 20 factorial over 15 factorial. Why is that? Because that's 20, 19, 18, 17, 16. And then over here implied is 15, 14, 13, 14, over 15, 14, 13, 14, 14, and they all just sort of disappear times 5 factorial. This was the answer we were looking for. Consider the complex number 7 plus 26i. 7, 26. This is that point right here. This is the ray that it's on. This is the angle of that ray. This is 7. This is 26. So the tangent of theta is equal to 26 over 7. If I take the inverse tangent, uh, whoops, inverse tangent of 26 over 7, I believe I get 75. 75 degrees. And here, in order to get this distance right here, I've got to take 26 squared plus 7 squared, make that equal to x squared. And x is about 27. Notice that it said here to round it to the nearest whole number. There was a reason for that. Because if you do that, then this number here in polar form is 27 cis 75 degrees. Which makes it incredibly easy to get the cube root. Because 27 cis 75 plus, of course, 360n degrees, all raised to the one-third power. Right, we take the third power of this, that would be 3. And then we divide this by 3, that would be 25 plus 120n. But we don't leave it like that because there are really only three answers here. Everything else is duplicative. So we just want to figure out what we get on one full rotation. 3 cis 25, 3 cis 145, 3 cis 265.